like drama. Do we wish we went to see the plays we saw this time around? And we're starting with Sanaz Tusi's Wish You Were Here at Playwrights Horizon. It delves into a group of Iranian female friends from the 70s to the 90s who support each other through weddings, births, deaths in those turbulent times. The girlfriends gather around worrying about certain smells, going to university, possibly going to Miami. Nazanin seems to be the focal point with everyone trying to get close to her, but she keeps everyone at arm's length for some reason. Even though she claims to love certain characters, it is hard to work up any emotion over such a prickly person. Not much happens. There aren't any dramatic conflicts, despite this taking place during the time of the American hostages. Plus, I wouldn't recommend this to men as they talk about their pussies and bush an awful lot. I really wanted to like this more as her previous play English was so profound and brilliantly written. Miss Tusi got the outer critic circle John Gassner warned. The acting was good. I wish they had more to work with, but it just wasn't there. So mixed face because actors redeemed this play. And now I went to a press conference for Islander, which unfortunately is closing June 13th instead of going on till July and August. And I talked to cast members, Kirsty Finley, Bethany Pennick, the composer, Finn Anderson, who's very blue, and uh, the director and one of the conceivers, Amy Draper. Here we are with... Amy Draper. And you are the director of Islander. I am, yes, and also one of the co-authors. Oh, you're one of the co-authors. And I wanted to tell the story of an island where there was only one young person left on it and what that meant in terms of their coming of age and what their prospects were in a world that um, at the time felt like quite fragmented. Um, this was around the time of Brexit, the Scottish referendum. Um, this is not a show about those things, but obviously the climate which we were making it informed it so it felt like a time when there was a lot of devi like divisiveness and so a show about somebody who needs to work out who they are where they're from and is helped to do so by an other a, dif a person from somewhere different felt potentially quite profound and i was also really excited about the prospect of a musical for just two female voices and then finn brought in the idea of the loop stations and um it went from there so a loop station is um, an electronic device which has many different channels and banks and um, an actor can hold a note, lay, um, record it and then layer up other notes on top of it. So with one single voice you can create the illusion of, of hundreds of voices or an orchestra and so they only use their voice in the loop station throughout but musically it feels very rich and full. A full orchestra, you've got all of this potential to, I don't get to compose for a full orchestra very often but you know if you do then you have all of these different possibilities open to you and when you're presented with such strong limitations, you know, just voices and the effects that the loop station uses, then you have to really think outside the box. It's uh, a song which is essentially an origin story and is a little bit mythical. River water reaches the tide of Here we are with 
Bethany Tennant. Um, so I play Ailey, who is the last um, the last child left on a depopulating island called Kinnan. Kinnan is a fictional island based on islands off the west coast of Scotland, where we made the show. Um, and the island is trying to vote on whether or not to leave and go to the big land, the mainland. Um, and a mysterious stranger washes up on the beach one day, and uh, which is what Kirsty Findlay plays, Aaron. Um, and these two girls kind of meet and they connect and they throw each other's worlds upside down. And I think the themes of the show, like home, family, and there's a bit of a theme of um, grief and loss as well, like I can't give anything away. Um, but I think that for somebody who is coming of age and somebody who is dealing with these new emotions and new feelings for the first time, especially loneliness, um, I think to see that represented in a, um, a really grounded and a lot of the times really funny way, um, I think is really important. It was originally devised as a family show, so you can bring your family along. But honestly, I think especially for teenagers, I, I think they'll love it. <laughs> Hello, here we are with Kirsty Findlay. She connects with Ailey, who's the kind of youngest member of the island, and they just connect in a way that helps them work through the problems that they're going through. She is a real character, like she does exist in this world, um, but she's not known anything else apart from her own island. She knows that all the other places exist, but her people keep away from the mainland, so everything's totally new for her and it's nice to discover to for a character to, to discover the world that we live in the way that it is that's really fun generally that's a big theme in our show in terms of connecting with someone who's from a totally different place from you but being able to connect over you know it's a bit of a coming of age story so because our characters are kind of in their late early to late teens they're in um, working through a lot growing up trying to figure out who they are and um, finding a kind of unexpected connection from someone who's from a totally different culture from them. I hope people get the the idea of yeah, connecting to yourself, connecting to where you're from or where you consider home and any idea of what that is. It could be about the people who surround you who you consider home or the place that you're from. Just a way to feel a way to kind of experiencing the connection of feeling grounded with where you're from. In Anna Nogueira's Which Way to the Stage, Jeff and Judy are very good friends who spend a lot of time trying to get Adina Menzel's autograph backstage at the stage door. They're also aspiring actors who are not getting jobs. At one audition, Judy meets Mark, who's conventionally handsome, conventionally masculine. He recently quit a job in finance and is doing much better than they are at getting acting jobs. He becomes very friendly with both Judy and Jeff and goes to Jeff's um, drag show where Jeff is working on Adina Menzel. He'd love to invite him. Mark seems to be very attracted to Judy, but he also seems like he might be attracted to Jeff. Who will he be with, if anyone? I know a man is coming between this really good friendship. And I just want to say that the, um, the actors, I love the actors, Seth Goldberg, who was in this wonderful play about bridesmaids and weddings, Max Jenkins as her friend, and Evan Todd as handsome Mark. And um, it was all about the, uh, Judy finding her inner diva, because she could sing, but she just didn't have that oomph. And Jeff was trying to get it out of her. And Jeff was just so caught up in like, you know, the whole backstage and wanted to do straight parts and, and he needed to find his inner person too. So this was really a wonderful play. It was so well done. I loved it. Yeah, totally enjoyable. Definite happy face. Yeah, it, you know, and the, I relate to it, you know, going back. I used to go backstage and wait for autographs myself. I never did get Shirley MacLaine. <laughs> Well, I'm, so I'm giving it a happy face. At the Flea is Michael Takeef's Jews, God, and History, not necessarily in that order. It's highly amusing and gets deadly serious in the second act when he talks about the Holocaust and his father's death. Full of humor, worthy of the Borscht Belt circuit. He makes it clear he's an atheist, yet he goes into the variations of being Jewish, reform, conservative, orthodox, reconstructionist, and even those pesky Jews for Jesus, and the various rules we have, but there's always loopholes to make it custom made for you, but some things are irrefutable. Never put mayo on your pastrami. 
The second act goes into quite details on the importance of the final part of the Yom Kippur service called Ne'ila and his admiration of this rabbi of his. It ends with the circumstances surrounding the death of his father, which was so touching it had me whip weeping. This show has a whole Megillah, laughter and tears, but I do have to warn you, this, this is a very specific Jewish show, so you might not get all the references, but funny is funny, and death of a loved one we can all relate to. I give this a happy face. About Love is a stage version of Turgenev's first love. It's set in 1833 and concerns Peter, who's 16, getting ready to go to college, has to study for his test, but is spending the summer instead enraptured and smitten by the girl in the small cottage next door, Zena, who's dominating every bachelor in the neighborhood. You know, a, a captain from the army, a count who's really rather malevolent, a kindly doctor, a morose poet. And she's 21, so she's considerably older than Peter. But she does seem to be genuinely fond of him. However, people soon discover that she must be seeing some other man secretly. She really wants to be dominated. Who is this mysterious other man? What will Peter learn and how will he grow up this summer? Yeah, this is a very sweet story. And the thing is, the minute the first sentence came out, I'm like, says to Mark, I'm like, oh my God, we see this already. We saw it just before the, um, the pandemic and they brought it back with a couple of different people and Will Pomerantz. And I mean, it, it's, it's like, she's like one of those Sally Bowles characters, you know, that stands out and you just, it, it, I thought it was very good. I, I still think it's very good. I'm glad they brought it back to other people. And it's in rep with the three sisters, we should say. By and they out. use um, sort of like songs that are original ones, but really do feel like old Russian folk songs and love ballads. And that um, they're great voices, especially Zena's. And they really do improve the show a lot. They really give it this sense of authenticity and romance. And we should say that they change characters from male to female with just a scarf or a vest or just, you know, taking their skirts off and having pants, very cleverly done. Yeah, it's, it's a really wonderful off-off Broadway production of a really great literary piece. So, happy things. Richard Greenberg's Take Me Out is back on Broadway. And it's 2002 and we're following the baseball season of the New York Empires. Their superstar player, Darren Lemming, is someone who up until now has had a really charmed existence. He's the um, son of a mixed marriage, black and white, but grew up very, very middle class and everyone has always loved him. His conservative Christian friend, uh, who's on another team, mentioned something about living authentically, and Darren takes this to mean that he should tell everyone he's gay, and this upsets the whole delicate balance of the team, and it gets even worse when an openly racist and homophobic new pitcher joins the team. I don't care how you react to my being gay, but when the chain goes after him for being a black man, that's when it gets under his skin. That's when he takes some action. That kind of motivates him. And you kind of wonder about this poor guy. It's like, yes, he's this horrible racist guy, but he was raised that way and he doesn't realize he's being terrible because all he cares about is pitching baseball. And all he can think about is, well, why can't I play baseball? I don't understand. And Jesse Tyler Ferguson plays the guy, uh, Darren's accountant, and he, he doesn't know anything about baseball. He falls in love with baseball. He's my favorite character. I get him so much. The way he like, you know, after a game and being all excited about the whole thrilling numbers relation of baseball. And he looks back at the stadium. And I did that too. 86, we won the World Series. I had to take a moment and just look at the empty stadium and like, we did it. And I understand that. And it's just, to me, I, as a baseball person, I love this. 
but I know you're not a baseball person, Mark, but you loved it too. Right. I, um, it does go into like all the special meanings of baseball, its relation to democracy and sort of spiritual ideas. And I got, I came to appreciate them during the show. I didn't need to bring them with me beforehand. I think it's a wonderful play and it's a very good revival. Oh yeah, it's it's so profound on so many levels. It's not just about baseball. It's about so many other things. And in this day and age with all this going on. It's really a great play about America. I would it, give it a definite happy face. Oh, absolutely positive. I'm giving it a major league happy face. How I Learned to Drive by Paula Vogel. This play is about pedophilia. It started 25 years ago and it's now being revived on Broadway with the same leading actors, Mary Louise Parker and David Morse. David Morse is brilliant actually. This, this subject matter is disturbing to say the least. Mary Louise Parker's aunt's husband is teaching her how to drive at a very early age. Her aunt, after a while, suspects something. She doesn't like this kind of very difficult, dangerous intimacy, but nobody stops this process. And she is so young, she cannot even hold the steering wheel. And she sits on his lap and things continue. And uh, uh, amazing thing is that nobody stops it. And she's not conscious what's going on, but the man knows, the uncle knows, you know, so, it was not a very enticing play for me. And I don't like the subject matter as well. The acting was good. And I will give a very mixed face to this play. Yeah, I'm with you, Bina, on this. I mean, obviously, pedophile is just yucky to me. And, you know, I mean, God, it's yeah. like. It makes me like that. Yeah. But the thing is with this, with the thing is with this is with Mary Louise Parker is her character in the beginning, you seem to think there's like a real relationship between them. And it isn't towards the end. You finally see that this really was a traumatic event. And um, yes, Mary Louise Parker and David Morris are wonderful actors. But at the Outer Critics Circle Award, which I found really touching with both of them, because they won the Ensemble Award, went on about what a brilliant actress Joanna Day was. And they gave her credit, which I thought was lovely, because she really is a marvelous actress. So it's a very unpleasant subject matter. People seem to find something in it that I just don't. So I'm, I'm giving an unhappy face because of what it is. Yeah, I agree with you. Nadzaki Shang's For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow is Enough features seven talented women who dance their way through the retelling of 20 stories of struggle. Each woman on stage remains nameless, identified only through the color worn. Collectively, the women support one another through their stories and form a rainbow. Through the unique form of poetry reading, stories of abuse, trauma, depression, abortion, and suicide are shared through dance. The show is not just targeted for audiences of color, the show is for all of those who are open to listen. The show touts perseverance and strength and enables individuals to find strength in themselves and their community. For Colored Girls breaks glass ceilings with its return, with Camille A. Brown making her directorial debut and in doing so becoming the first black woman to direct and choreograph a show on Broadway in 65 years. The timing of this revival is also significant in the wake of Black Lives Matter protests and abortion fights. I give the show a mixed face as I felt my engagement waning um, as the staging was entirely done uh, through dance and storytelling. This is a celebration of Black women everywhere. Dee Wood Yellow wants to lose her virginity on prom night. Stacey Sergeant Blue is really looking forward to seeing her idol, Willie Colon. Kanita R. Miller Red wants desperately to be wanted and wants someone to want her back, but at what cost? Amara Granderson Orange contemplates Eagle. Alexandria Wales Purple signs about Sushita dancing the night in New Orleans with mystical musings with gold coins flung. Tendaya Kumba Brown, as a child, discovered Toussaint in the adult section of the library. Okwia Okopowasi Green is angry when somebody almost walked off with all of her stuff, which isn't material things, but the very heart, soul, and body of her being. 
All these women may be swayed by the music that men and others may sing to them, but they don't take away their essence and they never win. This is a very powerful Shange choreo poem that Camille Brown has captured with her choreography and fluid directions. This was a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Happy face. At 59 East 59th Street Theaters, there are three Karen Hartman plays at the moment. New Golden Age is a confusing 2033 dystopian look at the new way to connect with people that didn't connect with me at all. Something to do with a pause and alienate people that Matt fixed with his all-encompassing world company called Sunlight. They have developed something called sun plants that are communication chips implanted in the back of the neck. They can get cells that hold memories from this procedure that are called sun seed bank tales, and they want talent workers to help bring these memories to life. So Polly, this out of work, horribly into talent worker, is tricked by Silas, who works for Matt, to sign a contract that will get them her half sister Lynn's memories. But to access these memories, one eats the DNA in hair. Ugh. What is the memory that Matt is trying so hard to get from Lynn, and what are the consequences that affect everyone in the pursuit of Lynn's memories? The author contrives an ending to make it a point that big corporations are bad. If you read my Facebook thing, it's a lot clearer because I quoted from the script a lot, but this gets such an unhappy face. So Goldie, Max, and Milk at 59 East 59th Street. This is a story of Max, a single lesbian mother who just gave birth to a new born child. She's unemployed, her house is falling apart, and enter Goldie, an Orthodox Jewish woman who is a lactation consultant who is supposed to guide Max into motherhood. The idea of this is wonderful. You have two women from diametrically opposed worlds who could have been wonderful and deep friends. What I found instead was a very confusing uh, play with too many characters on stage. I think if it had just focused on Goldie, the Orthodox Jewish woman, and Max, the uh, lesbian mother, and how they could have shared their lives and told stories about one another, it would have been a very moving and very beautiful play. But instead, we meet too many people. We meet Lisa, who is Max's ex-girlfriend. We meet Mike, who is the uh, sperm donor. We meet um, the daughter of the Orthodox Jewish woman. And it just gets so confusing that you really have trouble following what could have been a wonderful play. Um, again, if it had just focused on Goldie and Max, it would have been an odd couple with a lot of heart. As it is, it just turned into kind of a mishmash, and I couldn't follow it. So I definitely give it a, um, I don't give it even a happy face. I just give it a, a very sad face and a confused one. Well, there were so many elements in the story that I could relate to, but it was just too contrived that in the end, it lost all emotion that it could have generated. And as a single mother, I could appreciate what Max was going through. I also was thrilled to see an Orthodox Jewish woman on the stage. And I had a lactation coach, so I knew what that was all about. And she wanted her brother, Mike, to donate a sperm for Lisa to have a baby with Max because she wanted the baby. But then she shirks all responsibility by immediately dumping Max for her male boss. I guess she's bisexual. Then when things don't go her way with the boss, she wants Max and the baby back. She's a terrible person. The Cavalier attitude towards Mike being a drug dealer as if this was a legitimate business enterprise, I found a bit odd. And how do these people all end up in places that have nothing to do with them? So it was just, again, another contrived play from Karen Hartman that I didn't care too much for. But I mean, it's got Kit Lauren Molina in it and it's got a good cast, well played in a bad play, mixed face negative. Well, I guess third time really is the charm. Karen Hartman's The Lucky One is a true story based on a nonfiction book called Every Day Last a Year. It's a compilation of detailed letters from Krakow during the Nazi regime in Poland. Richard is telling us about his father, Joseph, and his family living in Poland. Joseph works for a travel agency and is a lawyer, and he tries to get his family to leave, but they foolishly stay while he gets out with his wife and 14-year-old Ward. 
Joseph tried to get to Lisbon and was rejected, so they end up fighting in courts trying to stay in America. The story of the family is very compelling, but then we end up in modern day 2010 with Richard and his son Craig, who is studying slave trade correspondence in college. I guess cultural approbation didn't exist back in 2010. Craig questions his dad, when did he find the family letters and how long did it take him to come to terms and translate them and try and find out more about his family? Finally, a play that Miss Hartman couldn't ruin because it was based on a true story. Even her interjection of the contrived Craig scenes couldn't take away from the initial premise about lost opportunities and survival. And it had an exceptional cast. So finally, I can give Miss Hartman a happy face. Hi, William Cataldi here for High Drama. If you have a serious interest in plastic arts and its 20th century history, you've got to catch Chasing Andy Warhol before it closes June 12th. Anyone at all interested in art about art needs to go. Bated Breath Theater Company specializes in street theater and they've raised the bar. As a spectator in Chasing Andy Warhol, you will breathlessly follow Andy through the streets of the Astor Place area like a television crew following greatness. Scenes are acted out at various points along the route, which trace Andy's life across some pretty rocky emotional terrain, punctuated by recreations of his art. This production transcends as the play is itself pop art, commenting on pop art. The design of this show deserves an award. Be prepared, however, to be able to walk blocks at a fast pace. Also, street art has a built-in flaw. The street promotion distracts from the show and dilutes its strength. To combat this, just try to concentrate. I give this show an exceptionally happy face plus. So our next show is June 18th, and we're going to have a review from Ben about Romeo and Bernadette. And Hey Man, which is closing June 18th. So the whole review will be on YouTube right now, but we'll try to do it properly on our next show. And the entire press conference of Islander will also be on YouTube. And don't forget, I put a list of all the plays that are going on and go to Facebook because some plays they reviewed but didn't get a chance to get to or whatever reason. So 